This is the second video in the introduction to Yocto series. So before you continue, make sure you've seen the previous video first, because in it we lay the foundation for everything we're about to uh, do in this one. But in case you did see it, welcome back. Okay, let's pick everything up where we left it in the previous video, which if you remember was at successfully building our own root file system. As I explained, this root file system will become our board's recovery file system, which will end up being flashed on the EMMC's boot partition. But let's not get too much ahead of ourselves and just focus on building the kernel next. And for that, we'll make our first recipe. When you work on a Yocto project, and once you have your distro and machine variables defined, it's recipes well, where you'll spend the vast majority of your time in. So it's worth familiarizing with them as much as possible. But the good news here is that they're not that complicated. And when you do know your way around one, you know your way around pretty, pretty much all of them, right? So let's go ahead and build the recipe for our kernel. And while at it, take a step further and also make a files directory inside it. The reason for which will become clear in a second. You see, for the kernel to be able to work properly on our hardware, regardless if we use Yocto to build it or we do it by hand, we need to configure it, which means it needs a .config file, and we need to build a device tree alongside that, which lets the kernel know how all the hardware fits together, and to apply the right drivers to the devices it finds in this device tree. I'll leave a link to our device tree in the description below, and for the purpose of this video, all we're going to do is copy it over into the newly created files directory, and I've already named it mono gateway minus dk.dts. The second thing we'll also put in the same directory is then the dev config file, which I'll also leave a link to in the description down below. This is your normal dev config that if you were building the kernel outside of Yocto, you'd use menu config to produce, right? So with all the dependencies in place, let's finally create our recipe file and we'll name it lin Linux, <laughs> Linux minus mono underscore 6.12.bb. The naming here is very deliberate, especially the version. It's written this way because it's, it makes it super modular. Say, for example, that a colleague of yours was working on their own layer for their own device, but would like to use your Linux build with only minor adjustments. Well, in that case, they'd put this layer that we're working on into their CAS configuration and simply name their own file Linux minus, minus mono underscore 6.12.bb append and just put their desired changes in there rather than having to develop the whole recipe from scratch. In fact, you know what, let's do it this way first because it'll make it easier to understand what the hell I'm talking about. Make a new file in the Linux directory and name it linux minus yocto underscore percentage sign dot bb append. The percentage sign is simply a wildcard that says any version of the kernel, which means it will append whatever we put into this bb append file to the default yocto kernel regardless of which version it is. Now, how do you know which version is it? Well, we can go and open our CAS file, which has all the layers defined, and open the one we're using, so the core open embedded layer, then open this repo in our browser, select the branch we're, we're working with, so Walnuscar, and finally navigate to recipes kernel slash Linux, and here you'll find which version is the default for this release, and as you can see, it's 6.12. Now, keep in mind, underscore in the name separates the name of the recipe and the version it's supposed to build. So here you can see Linux Yocto Tiny and Linux Yocto Dev also being present. But for this exercise, we're just going to go with the regular variant. Feel free to open it, but don't get too intimidated because this is literally a one size fits all approach. And once we're done with our own kernel recipe, we're going to use none of this. Now, before we can build this image, we also need to take care of two other things. Namely, we need to rename our BB file to something other than BB because otherwise Bitbake will complain about it. But more importantly, we need to go back into our machine definition and change the dummy Linux we entered in the previous video to Yocto Linux. Again, depending on your PC specs as well as your internet speeds, 
This may take a while the first time around, but once it's done, you should find the final image in the deploy directory. But there's not much we can do with this image, so let's instead build our own as we initially planned to. Delete the bb append file and instead rename our original back to .bb extension with the following contents. If this is the very first time you see a bitbake recipe, this might look intimidating, so let's break this down into more manageable and easier to understand chunks. The first three lines are what I call metadata, and the only two that the recipe needs to have are license related. You see, Yocto is very, very mindful when it comes to licenses, so you need to make sure that they are honored. This is because the final firmware image may be the result of thousands or likely even tens or hundreds of thousands of authors, and not including licenses might be even illegal in some cases, so Yocto kind of makes you not only define the license, but also make sure you provide the file that contains it as well as its f uh, MD5 checksum. Next, we inherit from kernel, which is what is called a BB class. Much like with your normal classes in various program languages, a BB class also includes a bunch of functions and variables that are then accessible to any recipe that inherits it. This BB class is also part of the open embedded core code, so feel free to explore it on your own. But for our purposes, let's just trust that inheriting from the kernel BB class means that our kernel will get built correctly, right? Next, we define our files directory to be included in the search path for bitbag and a couple of shortcut variables that make some of the subsequent lines shorter. I'm saying shortcut variables here because these are not bitbag variables. I've made them up with the sole reason of improving the readability of the code, right? The only exception in these four lines is the PV, which stands for package version, and Bitbake will use it, uh, well, as the version of this package, and in turn some directory names it uses to build it uh, for the recipe artifacts. Next, we come to the source URI variable, and you'll probably use this variable in 99% of your recipes. As you can see, you can use either a URL or a file or a number of files for that matter, and Bitbake will treat all of them as something that needs to be put in the source directory when building the package. Along with the source URI variable, we also provide the source revision variable, which is the commit hash for the URL we're providing. And this, my friend, is what makes Yocto so great among other things. This combination of these two is what guarantees that the exact same source code will be used to build not just the kernel, but as you'll see going forward, any package that you want to build yourself, which means you can build it on a hundred different PCs or servers or whatever, and be sure that all of the final images will be identical to one another, right? But downloading the sources themselves is of course not enough. We also need to tell Bitbake where we want these sources to be worked on, which is where the S variable comes in. These variables likely will bite you in the S at one point or the other, because we often have to define, uh, define which directory we want the sources to be downloaded to, which we want them unpacked into, then compiled in. The point being, many steps need their own directories, and Bitbake allows us to not define any and just use its default uh, defaults, which is not always the best idea. Of course, you won't see any issues with them in this video because I prepared everything in advance, but when a particular recipe is failing, oftentimes it's because one of these variables is either missing or misdefined. The good thing is, on the other hand, the majority of recipes use this exact same structure, so for the most part, we'll just copy and paste these lines going forward. And last but not least, we also have this do configure colon prepend function, because without it, the files we defined in the source URI variable would just end up in the root of your kernel sources. So we need to make sure they get copied uh, into the correct directories, which in the case of our dev config, it does get copied into what the root of where the kernel is being built, which we already established is not the same directory where it gets downloaded to. And the same goes for the device tree. We need to copy it into where the kernel source gets extracted this time around. The original do configure function that we're prepending in our recipe is, of course, defined in the kernel BB class that we're inheriting from, 
And since we're prepending it, it means hours run before the one in the kernel BB class does. So now that you understand this recipe, and even if you don't quite yet, don't worry, we're going to write a couple of them and things will get more clear as we go along. So let's just go ahead and build it. But before we run the actual bitbake command, let's go back into our machine definition and change Linux minus Yocto to Linux minus mono, run bitbake Linux minus mono. And if you've ran out of coffee, now is the time to make some more because this will likely take a moment or two. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. When I developed my custom mechanical keyboard, PCBWay manufactured both the prototypes as well as the production PCBs and the quality was nothing short of exceptional. So for our router project, I knew exactly who to turn to. They've produced prototypes for us throughout this entire journey, like the M.2 fit test cards, CNC milled plastic and aluminum enclosures, and even some parts for the final production units. PCBWay offers everything from PCB manufacturing to 3D printing, injection molding, and even sheet metal fabrication. Check them out using the link in the description. Okay, now that we have our custom kernel built, let's make a proper root file system to go along with it and not the core image minimal that we've used so far. But first, I want to answer a question that you likely have at this point. Where? As in, how do I organize my recipes or where do I put the image recipe at? Well, luckily for us, we don't really need to think about it. We can simply go and open the core open embedded layer and see where the professionals put them. For images, you can find them in the recipes core slash images. So we're going to use this structure in our layer as well. First, we're going to create the images directory and in it place the recovery minus image dot BB file. Same as with the kernel BB file, this is a bitbake recipe, but because we're inheriting from the image class, we get to define a couple of variables that pertain to the image building process, but nothing really that complex. In the image install variable, we define all the packages that we want, then let Bitbake know we want a passwordless root because remember, this is a recovery Linux, which will run straight from the EMMC boot partition in case things really go sideways, uh, sideways with our main operating system, right? For the same reason, we also remove any kind of package management and set the image file system type, which as you probably recall, we've already done in the machine configuration file, which is where we can remove it from because it doesn't really belong there. Now this final line, and you'll see this a lot, is for, let's say alignment purposes, because sometimes one recipe will by default name its output file one way, but another recipe expects, expects it to be named another way. So we sometimes have to make sure that we satisfy one by changing the other, so to speak. In our case, if we don't set this line, Bitbake would add the machine name in the file name by default, but the initial RAM file system wants the file name without the machine name in it, which means it'll show an error if you don't do this. You'll see what I mean soon enough, but for now, let's build the image. And while it's building, let's look at the file, in particular, the image install variable. At this point, you're probably wondering where do these packages come from? And again, when in doubt, look at the core layer. Curl, for example, can be found in recipes minus support. So if you want to know how it's built, just look at the recipe in the core layer, right? Now, if we go back and have a look at our build process, you'll notice that it's done and the resulting artifacts, as usually, can be found in the deploy directory. The kernel is 16 megabytes and the root file system is 14 megabytes. And that, my dear viewer, is way too much. Wait, too much? Well, yes, because remember, the whole boot partition on the EMMC drive is only 31.5 megabytes and we're still missing the rest of the firmware. So our goal is to have the combined image no larger than 21 megabytes. And by combined, I mean the kernel with an embedded initial RAM file system, which we will turn the recovery image into. But before we get there, notice how our kernel isn't compressed. Let's change that by first going into our machine definition and adding a .gz to the image. That's literally all we need to do here because the kernel image we're inheriting our, uh, our from already knows how to handle the compression based on the value of this variable alone. Pretty cool, right? And if we build it, you'll see how it went from 16 megabytes 
to 6.6 megabytes, which is much more manageable. And together with the recovery image comes just shy under 21 megabytes, which is exactly where we want it to be. Okay, now it's time to bring the two together. And for that, we'll modify our machine configuration file because again, the kernel needs to be configured and built for each machine differently. So it's here where the initial RAM file system configuration belongs. We'll simply add these three lines that let Bitbake know that we want to bundle an image into the kernel and what the name of the set image is. See the initRAMFS image name variable? Well, we modified the image name variable in the image recipe to match this one here. Their values aren't even important in this case. We could name both Jack. <laughs> the important thing is that they match because that's how Bitbake knows it's this image we want to use as the initial RAM file system. And while at it, we'll also define the device tree for this machine because in our kernel recipe, we only build the kernel itself regardless if we copy the device tree over into the source directory, right? Now, you might be wondering why are we defining the device tree in our machine configuration rather than the kernel recipe? Well, think about it from a practical standpoint. Let's say you want to test out different kernel versions or configurations on the same device, right? They all need the exact same device tree because the device tree is a representation of the actual hardware that all these kernels will end up using or running on. So it makes sense to put it here. That said, variables in Bitbake do get evaluated when they're needed, which is called a lazy evaluation. So if we move, the, move it into the kernel recipe, it will also work just fine. And with these couple of changes, let's now build the kernel again. One hour later. There we go. Our kernel plus the recovery image all in one single file that's 21 megabytes in size. Exactly what we wanted. Plus the device tree is also here, which is everything we need to run a recovery Linux on our board. But since this video is plenty long as it is, let's wrap it up by booting into this kernel with QMU using the following command. Of course, a bunch of drivers haven't loaded because we didn't provide it with a device tree because we're not actually running it on our device. But the kernel does boot and the file system is there, which is everything we need in order to run the recovery Linux straight from memory. If we go back and open the recovery image, you'll notice it includes what I think is everything necessary to reformat the corrupted DMMC, for example, or repartition it, or flash it with a new file system image. Basically everything you need for low level maintenance and debugging of your system, right? Okay, we've written our first two recipes and as you'll see in the next video in the series, not much changes from one recipe to the other. And we do in fact need to write a couple more of them because this image will actually become part of the final firmware image uh, that we will be able to flash on the EMMC and boot from it. So make sure to subscribe. And if you learned anything new in this tutorial, a like will be more than appreciated. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.